Hi and welcome to the Sunday podcast from the team at GMC, Gillespie Memorial Church in Dunfermline, Scotland. I'm Pastor Mike Weaver, the minister at GMC, and with our team, Reverend Maggie Lane, Reverend David Melville and Elder Ronnie Aitken, we are leading our church to be a people of God seeking to grow in God's word and so bless the city with the good news of Jesus Christ. Our sermon series, Living in the Light of Christ, Confidence and Encouragement in Christ, finds us in St. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, a letter full of affection for a church Paul, along with Silvanus and Timothy, had planted. It is a letter full of advice for the life of the Christian and their faith in the world. How to evangelise and be a pastor, how to withstand suffering in life and understand the priorities for Jesus in your life, always with the return of Jesus in mind. Written to a church of new believers, it still speaks to those young in faith, but also has much to say to all believers today, whoever they are. So thanks for joining us and I pray this podcast will be a blessing to you as we seek the truths in God's word. But before that, we come to the Lord in prayer. Let us join together in prayer. As we gather, dear Lord, calm our whirring minds and troubled hearts, restless hands, and bring us to a stillness before you, that we may be aware of your presence with us here. The Lord is our strength and our song. He has become our salvation. He is our God, and we will praise him. God of new life, God of risen hope, As we gather here today, may we know your resurrection power in our lives, and may our spirits be renewed, may our bodies be restored. O Lord, we we come before you to confess that we have not always lived and done and said as we should have done. Humanity has done so much to steward and shepherd the good earth, but has also done much to harm its atmosphere and deplete its resources. Forgive us, Creator God. Humanity has too often torn down and not built up, too often polluted and not replenished. Forgive us, Creator God. In this season of creation time and the coming harvest time, open our eyes to what can be done to protect and heal our world. Open our ears to the calls for sustainability and open our mouths to speak of earth's glories and how, as children of faith, we determine to pass on to generations coming as much of the beauty and diversity, as much of the astonishing and delight that this earth holds. And, O Lord, we confess that We have said and done things in this past week for which we are ashamed. Show us where we have gone wrong and help us to accept your word of forgiveness. Give us the courage to make amends where we can and the the ability to live more nearly as you would have us live in the days to come. Lord, we bring you our prayers of thanksgiving. Almighty God, we thank you for your abundant blessings and for your never-ending presence in our lives, for friends and families 
and for all those whose work provides us with the necessities of life. Help us to appreciate the world around us and to take time to enjoy it and the, and the gifts of others as they provide books and works of art, thing, they provide music and sport and so many good things in our lives. Help us to see and to appreciate what is there for us and to cherish it. These prayers we ask in the name of Christ our Saviour, whose we are and whom we serve. Amen. I hope through our prayers your heart is ready to receive deeply from God's word. Whatever life is throwing your way currently, whether life is going great or times are stormy, please know that the word of God is powerful. God's word is able to challenge, to transform and ultimately to change your life. So listen in to the reading and the exposition from our preacher. If the reading from the Bible and the message from our preacher raises any questions or doubts or maybe challenges you over the way you are living life today, or perhaps you just want to know more about the way of Christ and getting to know the Lord Jesus, then we'd love to hear from you. Please get in touch via our website or through the office. Details are in our show notes. If you'd like to support GMC financially and our ministry for the kingdom, then offering details can be found on the homepage of our website, gillespiechurch.org. Now, over to our preacher. So this morning we've heard the Guild strategy for this year is Shaw Foundations on their three-year strategy of building a house. And we know that metaphor of building a house, well constructing a house, uh, means that it can be durable, it can be beautiful even, and functional. But without foundations, it does no durability, functionality, or beauty. Much like life, Jesus talked about, do not build a house on the sand, but on rock. So I'm going to make a big claim this morning that the bedrock, the foundation, the cornerstone of Christian faith is found in one single verse in our Bible. Just one. I'm not saying that's the only verse we need and we can discard the rest of Scripture. Far from it. But what I am saying is this one verse is crucial to faith. That if we don't understand it, that if we don't believe it, then the house that is our Christian faith will fall down. It is that important. John's Gospel has seven I am sayings, and they are all hugely significant words of Jesus. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I'm the gate for the sheep. He's the shepherd and he's the sheep. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the last I am statement, I am the true grapevine. But it's this sixth of these seventh, seven I am sayings that is my focus this morning. Where we hear this in John's Gospel, Jesus is in the upper room. He has shared the Last Supper. He's sharing teaching with them. He's teaching them about what will come once he is no longer with them. That the world will hate them but they will become equipped with the Holy Spirit and what they can also expect in the life beyond this one. And he talks about going to his father's house to prepare a place. And we hear Thomas counter the words of Jesus, you know the place to where I am going. And Thomas counters, Lord, we don't. We don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And I suggest that reply of Jesus is the foundation stone to Christian faith. And if you don't yet have faith, then that's a call to know him. For without believing that Jesus is I am, without acknowledging he is the way, without accepting his truth, without following his way, 
there is no foundation to belief or saving faith. So I'll try and be as brief as I can, but I'm going to go through five things. I am. I am. Ego ime in the Greek. I am is the name God gave to himself. If we cast our minds to Exodus 3, Moses at the burning bush. Moses is saying, nah, don't call me, I'm nothing special. And he is concerned that when he goes before the Israelites to say, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, he's imagining himself be- before the Israelites. And he's going to say, they're going to ask me, what, what is the name? What is the name of the Father? What shall I tell them? God replies to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. The I in the I am is I, God. I, God, am. But what does am, emai, mean? It means to exist, to be. If something is, it exists. Ego emai says God pre-existed. He has always been. There is never a place where, a place or a time he hasn't been. He is divine. He needs nothing outside of himself to exist. He's not dependent upon anyone or anything to exist. Unlike us. Unlike humanity, which is completely dependent upon our needs to be met from outside of ourselves. God has no need to be met outside of himself. He is, I am. He is not, I am going to be. He is not, I am what I used to be. He is just simply, I am. Unchanging, absolute. And so by Jesus taking that statement upon himself, it's explosive. He equates himself with God. Jesus, I am, I am divine. Co-equal, co-eternal with God. John's gospel starts with this. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus Christ, the living, breathing word of God, was and is God. Yet Philip, I didn't read on further, but Philip doesn't follow. Philip says, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough. And Jesus replies in verse 9, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you for such a long time, three years at this point, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. I'll paraphrase C.S. Lewis's quote in Mere Christianity because it matters. C.S. Lewis talks about the claim of Jesus to be God, that either he was a madman or something worse, a liar, or he was Lord, God, the Son of God. Either he was a blasphemer or he was exactly who he says he was. I am. And if you're a Christian, you should know that. Jesus is Lord, divine, co-equal with God the Father. I don't know whether you know. Maybe you don't. In the book of Acts, which tells us the story of the early church, how many times do you think the word saviour appears in it? Guess? Anyone? Okay, I'll tell you. Two. How many times does the word Lord in reference to Jesus appear? Over 90. The early church was more concerned about the lordship of Jesus, the fact that he was God, than he was about the saving nature of Jesus. I believe today we flipped our focus. We're more concerned about salvation than we are about the lordship over our lives. Should we not to take to heart Thomas's statement when he first sees Jesus in the upper room, the resurrected Jesus upon 
seeing and touching Jesus, seeing the wounds. He says, my Lord and my God. He doesn't say my Savior, my Lord and my God. Or Peter's sermon at Pentecost. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. So point one is Jesus is co-equal, divine with God. The next he claims, I am the way. So what is the way? A way is a path, it's a road, it's an avenue, it's a route to follow to something. But note the definitive article here, the. I am the way. He's not saying, I'm one way. I'm a way. I'm one of many possible ways. But he is saying, I I am the way to God. This is the exclusivity of Christ, that he is the one and only. And it's a really unpopular message in our pluralistic world. Many people are spiritual and they follow their way, their own path. But Jesus says, I am the way. We are not born on the way. Genetically, that cannot happen because our original parents, not the name on the birth certificate of your parents, the original parents are fallen, were fallen. So we are fallen. So how do we get on the way? Our parents can't get us on the way. Our families can't get us on the way. Our church family can't get us on the way. The traditions of our churches, the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, don't get us on the way. Once we're on the way, they are absolutely ways we come to know God more when we partake of these things through our church. But in and of themselves, they are not the way. Mary and the saints are not the way. Muhammad is not the way. Joseph Smith and Mormonism is not the way. Confucius, Buddha, shamanism, nor paganism, nor any other human religion are the way. Jesus Christ is the way. He said, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road, the road, the way, that leads to life and only a few find it. So I ask, are you on the way? It might be narrow, but it is accessible to all. And once on the way, you can't step off it. If you're on the broad path, if you are struggling, on the senseless way that leads to destruction, will you change your path? Will you seek the narrow gate and step onto the way of Jesus Christ? But how is that possible, you might ask? Because Jesus Christ is the way and the truth, the third point. You get on the way by simply knowing and believing and accepting the truth of God. And notice there's an and here the way and the truth. It's not the way or the truth. It's not not an either or. They come together. The way and the truth. So what is truth? The truth. I looked at what the word truth means. It means what things are actually in reality. The reality of something is its truth. And in this case, the reality of Jesus Christ is that he is the truth. Again, if I go back to the opening of John's Gospel, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 14. And then at verse 17 of the same chapter, the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Today we live in a world of multiple truths. But if we believe that, if we believe there are multiple truths, we are swallowing a lie. 
There are many lies in our world but one truth. And so there is no slipway, no on-ramp like you would have onto a motorway, onto the way without the truth. The truth is the way of God, for Jesus said it was the way to freedom. We have a banner, it's not up at the moment, it's up in the office. We change our banners around. We have one that says, a logo on it, it says, come and find freedom. To the Jews who had believed, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Freedom. So if you're not in the truth, you're not on the way. And then you are on the exit ramp onto the broad gate leading to the broad way of destruction and oblivion of hell. But there's a fourth point. Jesus Christ said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Another and here again. Life. We think of life in human terms. We think of new life born of a mother's womb, a person who grows up into childhood, adolescence, adulthood, living life with all its joys and its struggles. But that is just what it is, human life. And it's one that's marred by sin. For none, not one is righteous in and of ourselves. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul writes in Romans 3.23. But what does that mean? I mentioned it earlier. We are born in spiritual deadness. The fallenness inherited from our first and original parents is manifest in us. So if we are spiritually dead... How can we become alive? In physical death, the heart will stop, the blood no longer flow, the brain will die, and once that happens, there is no possibility of human life. We are born with human life, but spiritual death. We die a human death, but can have spiritual life. That spiritual death can be changed. New spiritual life is possible, not through anything we do, but through the life of God, the regenerate life that Christ offers. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and it's the life I will bring to you. It's a regenerating work of the Holy Spirit as he supernaturally and immediately changes the disposition of the soul from spiritual death to spiritual life. That's how R.C. Sproul put it changes the disposition of the soul from spiritual death to spiritual life. If there's people, I'm not sure here, but th this goes out on the podcast, if there's people listening who don't know Christ, I pray today that they would invite him in. That regeneration would be the beginning of conversion because it's when you're turned around 180 degrees in them to move in a different direction, when you move from the broad path of destruction onto a narrow way of life. And it happens in an instant. At the first Pentecost, about 3,000 were added to their number that day, it says. This, this isn't something that happens over a long period of time. Our regeneration, our being born again, happens in an instant. It carries on in Acts 2 saying, the Lord added to their number daily they were those who were being saved. Some were added on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and probably the Lord's Day too. If you are a believer, your conversion was a result of regeneration in an instant. You might not know it, you might not recognize it, you might not be able to put your finger on it. But it happened in an instant, and you received life, eternal life, the life of Christ. In, one, uh, in John 1, verse 4, it says, In him was life, and that light, that life was the light of all mankind. This eternal life is a light of Christ indwelling in the believer. And we receive it not when we step into heaven. But now, now this is eternal life, that you, that they know you, 
the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And it is an abundant life. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. John 10.10. 10. Abundant life is the provision of God to believers both now and in the age to come. It's the fullness of God's provision beyond any needs you have right now. Eternal life in Jesus right as you step onto the way. But I talk about eternal life as if it's just for believers. It's not. We all have eternal life. It's just where we're going to spend it. Emma and I, when we were away on holiday, we were walking the dog, uh, Toby. We were, uh, we were kind of, we weren't lost, but we were on this narrow path, and, and, it, and it, <laughs> narrow path, and it came out onto this broad path, and we came out through a hedge, and there was a lady walking a dog, and she was a bit surprised as we emerged with Toby. And we got briefly chatting, and she was recently moved into the area. She'd moved there. Her, her two children lived abroad, one in Canada, one somewhere else. They were in the military. Her husband had passed. And she said this. She said, I'm not sure I'm happy here because I'm alone, and I don't really know anyone. Uh, everyone in my family has, are dead apart from my two boys. And then she said, some of them are up there, some of them are down there, but most of them are down there. <laughs> Which I thought, and that's the point. Life is eternal. The destination is the choice. So Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. It's not a selection, bo bo selection box. It's a package. One cannot be separated from the other, in a moment that you receive life through the Holy Spirit, you believe, you know the truth, and so you enter onto the way. But there is one final truth, if you could just bear with me in this verse. Jesus concludes this statement in which he says he is co-equal with God, that he is the way of God, that he is the truth of God, that he is the life of God, using a clear-cut negative denial with no exceptions. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's a restating of that idea of the narrow gate and the narrow way. It's another way of saying, I am the gate for the sheep. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture, find life. And it's exclusive it's offensive, and I get that. But it's that because it is startlingly simple in its truth. But it is, as I mentioned or alluded to earlier, universal. It is a universal invitation because it is open to all who will listen. Open to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. Open to those that the Father draws to himself. And the way people come is by the way of the person of Jesus Christ. And then the Son gives them to the Father. It's a symbiotic relationship. The Father draws them to the Son, and the Son gives them to the Father. That's why he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you in my Father's house in heaven. It's not the house that matters. The Guild's project is sure foundations. It's about building a house. But the house of God is only the house of God because he resides there on the throne with the son next to him, waiting to receive you. This statement Jesus makes in response to Thomas's question is staggering in its simplicity, its directness, it, directness and its exclusiveness. Jesus leaves no choice, no chance of misunderstanding the foundational nature of his statement. He didn't intend to. As a minister here, I'm committed to the way and the truth of the word of God in the Bible. Where... 
Jesus regenerates lives by the way of God, the truth of God, and the life of God. That is the sure foundation, the way of faith. Are you on the way? Are you on the way? And many of you are. Are you all on the way? Here in church this morning, or as I've said, those who might listen on the past podcast later, are you on the way? Because if you're not, then I ask, will you accept the truth and the life and come onto the way? That, in my mind, my heart, is the most meaningful question anyone can ever be asked in their entire life because it affects where their eternity they will reside. The writer to the Hebrews said, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us. Jesus opened the way. Come on to that way today, opened through the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for our Lord Jesus. I want to thank you for the whole of Scripture, from the opening words of Genesis to the closing words of Revelation. But Lord, I want to thank you for this verse. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to the Father is through me. Father, may we be bold in proclaiming that, but may we also be compassionate. May we be compassionate and loving, serving those in our church and those beyond our doors in the love of Jesus Christ that more may know your way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Sunday podcast from our team. If you'd like more details about GMC and who we are, what we believe and how we serve, then visit our website at gillespiechurch.org. Find us on Facebook or look back at some of the videos on our YouTube channel. Just search Gillespie Memorial Church. All inquiries can be made through the Contact Us page on our website. Again, details are in the show notes. If you'd like to support our work with a financial donation, then offerings can be made by clicking the Support Us with Stewardship icon through the homepage of our website. If you liked what you heard, then please follow our podcast page, like it and share it with friends and family. This has been a production of GMC, including the pastors and the tech team, or copyright remains with the producers. Today's episode was edited by Jack Wiggle, and the soundtrack is Blessed Assurance by the team at City of Light, performed by Gordon Eastop and Mike Weaver. Thanks for listening, and God bless.